about since we're talking about intersectionality and the statistics you, you mentioned about the participation of women were of course very interesting uh, and, and positive in, in many aspects but what about Albanian speaking women from Muslim backgrounds because this is the, the blind spot of much of research on Yugoslavia oh, it often is so I'm, I'm wondering how, what were the numbers there and I mean, it's actually a connected question of Chiara. Uh, when Lida Tomšinč and all the, the rest of them were being active on this international stage, how much of their work was also focused on the same, the very same Albanian-speaking women from Muslim backgrounds? Was that something that they were interested in, that they did work on, that they engaged with? Uh, so yeah. So I don't have uh, the specific data. I think that they could be, with some creative thinking, extrapolated from the existing statistical data, which were very detailed and made on Republic level and so on, especially uh, since uh, Kosovo uh, was a statistical unit in itself and it was not very numerous. So you can basically count how many people with PhD on how many institutions were working. However, there was um, intellectual production in Albanian. There were institutes which were bilingual and um, publications which were bilingual. And uh, um, what I want to say is that um, uh, I cannot say to what extent this particular ethnic group was um, in, in which position it was uh, uh, num numerically. Probably it was lower numbers compared to uh, Slovenia or big university centers like Belgrade and Zagreb. Uh, however, there are important biographies and role models. So one of them is included in the book I edited. It's uh, Drita Bakia Gunga, historian uh, from Kosovo. Uh, Diolca and Delife Krisnici wrote about it, about her. Uh, and uh, her intellectual production is not known, but I think it's very rele relevant. Uh, she was historian writing about uh, participation of Albanian women in workers' movement in national liberation fight. She wrote about uh, emancipation processes, unveiling of women, particularly in Kosovo. And uh, up until this moment, we know much more about, let's say, Bosnia regarding unveiling of women than Kosovo. However, she was published. Uh, she was publishing in Albanian in this, for instance, bilingual uh, historical journal Kosovo Kosova that was uh, published by Institute of Contemporary History in Pristina, which exists still today and has archives. However, uh, the knowledge about her uh, is nowadays forgotten outside of Albanian community. However, Al Albanian feminists are aware of her. And what uh, I think is the next step is doing this uh, mutual translation to see, you know, what is there uh, more to research. Okay, I think, I mean, I, I don't have enormous amount of elements to, to reply to this, but definitely they were aware of this whole issue of population control in Kosovo, because it happens uh, at a time in which they're still active in this whole debate on family planning and population policies and they have some projects with the united nations related to population and uh, and i found some some material in which in which their um vida especially she's she's saying you know we, we cannot have this uh type of uh, police control over women to tell them or to tell them what to do in relation to their reproductive rights like the the, the like i think she stood by that principle that um like, and that was something that they, they both brought into the non-aligned platform, but also in this IPPF platform, this anti-Malthusianism. Right? So Nevenka Petrich, she was very much promoting this idea that um, you cannot control population by just uh, sterilizing people or doing things against their will. You need to promote development so that people will be conscious it's not enough to then take their own decision. And that's something that they um, kept repeating, and that was kind of the stance of non-aligned countries. And that's something that they use as well for the Kosovo case. Because mm -hmm. they say, you know, you cannot, these this women will stop having 10 children once they have 
distant economic situation and, and, and development, and we cannot just uh, control them uh, by police means. So I think in that sense, they were quite uh, aware of, of, of that problem. I found one of less known interviews uh, by Vida Tomšić in, in late years, where she was uh, scolding these like macho guys uh, in, um, uh, in, in different councils, decision-making uh, bodies who were, um, uh, as she said, uh, pulling out this like demographic card mm -hmm. every, every now and then when they wanted to curb um, abortion rights. And she was very against it. She it's in between lines, but uh, she recognized, you know, the the racist and national element yeah, in yeah. it. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. I have a question yeah. for Isidora, a little bit selfish question. You know, <laughs> don't know why. Uh, did, did you notice that in her work you were about, you were talking about? Since she has a migrant experience, does she recognize this intersectionality or also problem of migrations in her work? No, I mean, not even yes. migrants. <laughs> yeah. Yes, in terms of, uh, so, okay, so I said first no, because I was thinking whether she, uh, she talked about this experience of going from place to place in Europe. I mean, she just basically described it, but I think, Maybe we could say that implicitly she does uh, address it in terms of migration of women from the peasant context yeah. to to um, to the city. So Kaya's story is exactly that, mm -hmm. and I think the migration is behind this uh, migration and experience of of uh, I'm sorry, I'm suddenly very tired. <laughs> 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 A bit difficult. Uh, so this um, experience of growing up in the countryside, in poverty, and then going away from the rural uh, context to the city is actually what the, it's Kaya's story. So I think in, in this sense, she, I mean, I was interested in her work from the perspective of what, how peasant women, or, or in this case, uh, specifically Kaya are described. And what does it tell us about the rural context? And then I was thinking about how actually um, she brings with her, with her work, she brings the rural context somehow to the city and problematizes uh, these differences between who does what kind of work in the city and what are the social backgrounds of the women. So, I mean, she does it implicitly, but she does not, I haven't found in, in the interview, for instance, that she actually talks oh, well, about I was thinking it. about the story. Mm -hmm. She does from a, from a yeah. story entirely. Yeah. <laughs> this. So, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Yavana, I, I, I'm interested in the slide that you show about the, the sources. There is the ego document. Yeah. Um, is this what you named it, or it's like you use ego documents? Um, I found this as an expression, which is an umbrella term uh, for, um, uh, yeah, for, uh, I'm going to, because I wrote it, uh, for different types of, um, so, autobiographies, memoirs, uh, spe specifically for women scientists, uh, a common genre is this, like, collection of uh, publications, uh, you know, women in physics. So, for instance, we have it, here, you know, uh, physica, my, uh, physics, my vocation, where uh, different women are retelling how they decided <laughs> to study physics okay. because this is unusual field for women. It sounds so weird. I mean, it's like, like the whole uh, bunch of associations that bring because uh, I would say like self representation or something like that. And okay. I think like this, um, also what you said when our, uh, uh, your in interview, your interlocutor, or your informant, or whatever, how we call it, her uh, goes through the text and s throws certain things out. What you see is the way how she wanted to be presented. And of course, these silence things are so interesting because that uh, tells you so much about the social political context. Yes. There, there is this ethical issue then that is problematic because, of course, you are naming her. I mean, um, it's so hard to talk about it, and this is makes it also relates to actually all of you who are working with biographies. 
um, that it's, I guess, very hard to talk about the silenced parts and how they are part of various regimes and discourses as a like, part of social political context and then bring a person with a name and the way how she wants to be represented, especially if the person is still alive. But also, yeah. um, I, I would say that well. I don't read the ego with a negative connotation mm -hmm. in that sense, but more as a... Produced by self, by about self. self. Yeah. 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 Just, I think that the associations that get me, for example, I, it was not good. I mean, it was not good for me. Uh, that, um, for me that's, uh -huh. uh, yeah. that, uh, oh, I, I haven't I thought, it's thought about it. Like, yeah. It's like, isn't like self-representation very, very important? I mean, the way how people want to be represented and what does this tell us? Because this tells us a lot, I think. What they silence out, what is this ideal that we all want to, like, approach to? And I guess in practical terms, if we look at it as at least from a perspective of psychoanalysis, the ego is a very fair analogy we could use in that sense, what you want to say, that how you want to portray yourself outwardly. So. I do think that, I mean, it depends on how you read the term, but in, I think particularly in that sense, ego documents do fit. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I found this expression uh, so somewhere when I was trying to, you know, uh, uh, cluster the types of sources and different methodologies that I need mm -hmm. for analyzing them. Because it's very different if you have a text written by a person about herself or a text written by a junior colleague uh, uh, about their senior colleague or a mentor, which is actually uh, a dominant way how biographies of uh, scholars and scientists actually come to us, because most of them don't write memoirs or publish diaries or write autobiographies. It's their junior colleagues who write in memoriams, uh, uh, edit books uh, about them and uh, uh, keep the memory or create this public image. Uh, and um, here also there is another level of silencing, not just the silencing uh, related to self-representation, but uh, the silencing of, uh, uh, you know, being collegial, so um, not um, reporting on conflicts. But this type of documents that generally do not reveal conflicting issues or, you know, professional biographies always list your uh, or a person's success successes not the failures or if the failures uh, are mentioned they are explained away with something that is you know a moral victory in the story but generally um, a failure to you know uh, get promoted mm -hmm. to senior professorship is not part of a professional biography but it is very important for understanding women's experience in this competitive field. So this is what I'm grappling with. Uh, and uh, I think for now, uh, what uh, uh, is most meaningful to do is to try to focus on those cases where you have a heterogeneous type of uh, data mm -hmm. and information so you can you know, create a puzzle about the person. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, one more thing, all of these uh, publications types of publications, including media representations like, you know, interviews or portraits, which is very popular for, you know, a woman got a Nobel Prize, here is a story about her. Um, these are all genre type of documents <laughs> that have a pre-defined uh, 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 narrative arch. For women, uh, especially in, in uh, intellectual and competitive fields, it's usually, you know, the first with a PhD, the first professor, the first award winner. Uh, so this is the frame of the story, which very often distorts other parts of the story or excludes them. But also, I think, in, I mean, in the in the sense of that, in in this phase, uh, sorry, but I think is one of the narrative genre when we look at the socialist period is also like this kind of self. Critical, but also not that critical narrative like that would also silence certain elements that progressive narrative, you know, like, oh, we started from the partisan movement and then we mm -hmm. kind of progress mm -hmm. further. So I think that, that that type of communist biography is also something that yes. might be quite um, you know, the success story in, in relation yeah. to, you know, sacrificing for the others. And uh, yeah, de definitely that one. 
Oh, well, but uh, the similar thing happens with uh, biographies or autobiographies written after the fall of socialism. Yeah. And that is, you know, explaining away why you participated. For instance, mm -hmm. Alexandra Kornhauser was a, a, a part of the government in the 70s. And this is the part of her biography that she is like apologizes for. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I just have a question to touch upon the sources. I may sound like very type of historian now, but talk about the hybrid sources. About? Are archives. So, because for example, in this case, especially if you look at, I don't know, promotions and stuff like that, you have the university archives of, let's say, Senate and so on, that are very still preserved, most probably, and you can find everything there. For example, for their socio political work, for Alexander Kornhauser, particularly, yeah, yeah, she you can is. find her. At, also in the late 60s with her work in the piece, <laughs> so that no, it's about your own description. Yeah, yeah. I'll translate again so you can find her there as well. And you can find a lot of the works in the archive as well, on the in intellectuals working in other organizations. But, yeah, and yeah. of course, in the, of, on their work as well, but that's in the university archives and not in the Lugano or national yeah. archives. She is an interesting and important figure, and she did a lot about mm -hmm. preserving memory of herself. Uh, also, <laughs> like uh, a year before she died, she she published this autobiography, uh, you know, where she is a heroic figure of her own life. It's actually uh, quite a bestseller when it came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Working in a bookshop, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but I was uh, she she was a complex person yeah. because she was also very politically and then later internationally active in UNESCO. Um, uh, what I'm most interested in are these like average <laughs> scholars and scientists. Yeah, I think university uh, archives are the best. Yeah, yeah. Way to go this is something that I would need to. So I applied uh, uh, three times with uh, parts of these are parts of uh, mm -hmm. project applications, and I'm uh, waiting with Urshka for uh, the final one to, to see the results. And, um, yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, because the archival work was something I could not uh, do without really uh, dedicated time to it. Yeah, yeah, I have a question for Chiara, who's in relation to school, by the way. Um, you mentioned, Chiara, how, how the, the committee asked you about that you, you, that you always have to be aware that there was a state socialism and they were controlled by those political organization. Um, is there the same narrative also, you know, about the second wave American feminism, how the CIA was involved in it? Or, you know, would they ask the same thing? Of course yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> um, good one. No, I mean, that's just not an island, and that's... Yeah, okay. I mean, it's fair enough in the sense of, you know, that, that it has to be a critical level of not wanting to reproduce uh, this feminism uh, mm -hmm. or not I propaganda, but yeah. Of course, there is a free world where feminists weren't involved in the yeah. secret service, and there is an unfree world when everything is inside. Yeah. For that, I always uh, go back to what Francisca de Han told me at the beginning when I was doing the PhD. She said, But don't think that the other side was not politicized, like, mm -hmm. you know, because the other side was also um, quite um, had politicized in the anti communist sense, especially when you have these American liberal organizations. So that would be interesting to see how it played out. Uh, so one part of the project, uh, when I was mentioning this uh, organization in the Global South, that would be interesting to see how this whole year played out in those organizations, because some of them were affiliated with WDF only, but some were also affiliated with all these other organizations. They were kind of uh, picking and choosing, you know, which kind of event they would attend or um, so. In certain places, like somebody is doing a PhD, Sarah Panata, she did a PhD in Nigeria, and they were clearly divided the anti communist local organization, the communist ones, or like leftist ones. But in other places, it was more um, blurred. So that would be interesting to see how, um, yeah, women from, from non aligned countries, they kind of um, dealt with this big organization that were you know, either pro communist or anti communist. And I wanted to mention that, those, that, that biography that you wrote of Vida, right? and I, if you could come back on that story, that it was something about how she was not happy when she was represented as not being one of the pioneers, or something you wrote, that she, there, was, there was a moment in which she kind of 
was not happy about how she described or oh, yeah. included in some uh, specific yeah. way from that particular story. I think that's interesting about the setup. Oh yeah, it was um, it was one Nasha Jaina, I think. I, I, I will speak from my mind now, so sorry. Yeah. And they, I don't know any date. date. Um, Nasha Jaina had a special issue about, I don't know, whichever anniversary of um, female press sort of thing. And they did the whole thing about, you know, from Slovenka, different female publications as it were, and how women's movement was also, you know, present from the Austro-Hungarian Empire on. And then, um, yeah, she, when she, of course, read it, she then wrote, um, I'm not included enough or something like me, plus two other friends, I think also Angela Otsipa and another person she mentioned, um, please include us or something. But what I found fascinating it was that she she left this post it um, in in her archive. So you know she wasn't vain in a sense that pretending I'm not politicized, I'm not interfering. She interfered and she left the document of her in, interference. So <laughs> that's what I found um, quite quite decent actually. Yeah. So just the like, document was never published or anything. No, I think they, they the, the, I think that they were really young, they, they changed it before the printing because he in her archive she still has the issue that you know the first issue mm -hmm. and then the reissue, reissue was changed or something i'm not sure I, I mean, it was a few years ago today yeah because one part of Nasha Jena for the 40th or 50th anniversary was censored maybe this is the part <laughs> maybe yeah maybe this was the, this one i'm not sure mm -hmm. Uh, but um, but they had uh, huge problems with Nasha Jaina in a way. Uh, also, Erna Muster writes a lot about it, uh, about uh -huh. how um, how it's all too too stupid. They don't write about theory and communism and you know great men like Engels uh -huh. anymore. All they care about is nice clothes and you know. I think also here it was discontinuity or like something like of the how it was historized. It was mm -hmm. not proper. Yeah, but maybe maybe this is the one. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'll I'm check. Just, I, I'm see. interested in how you two are going to approach and how this this is the legacy you said about Vida Tomšić because how she's uh, perceived in Slovenia. Also, what you said like non-alignment movement. Why there was no interest to study non-alignment movement here in Slovenia for so long, and still it's not, even though now internationally this is a huge topic. Like regarding Yugoslavia and the role of Yugoslavia, and maybe maybe very very slowly, yeah. um, like the the perception, the legacy, and the where, because you're for foreigner <laughs> dealing with uh, Vida Tomšić here in Slovenia, and I don't know how the perception was when you were like researching that. Is if the because uh, I remember when I talked to people being interested and why not interested, it was oh. She's too political. It's just politics. Yeah, it's but like, like, like all the men. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what I found funny is, you know, the series of biographies, Druga uh, the other half. Uh, there's a representation of Lydia Shinkir there, who's another big Yugoslav mm -hmm. politician. And she was kind of known as the behind pulling the strings person. And I find it very interesting that even in a feminist publication, she's described as bipolar. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So still, you know, the terminology that's always been, oh, you know, she was very, you know, aggressive for head of the three, but she was by color, so everyone's afraid of her. It's like a bit... Mm. Yeah, but that's yeah. not that this typical stereotype of the feminist woman. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah but it's, you know, even if it's reduced, even if it's supposed to be a feminist location, yeah. And, you know, I think it's quite, you know, there, there's this new book, uh, you might have seen this, uh, Paul Gray Handbook of Communist Women Around the World, and Participated and then the yeah it's I found I, I haven't read it all yet I need to read the review but there, there are some where where it's really this mythology also built around this women right so there is there is a trigger but then it's very hard to access the sources in a way that's not biased because there is a communist mythology around it but also the anti-communist mythology so how do you then navigate through those uh, framings and narratives and and paradigms, right? And for instance, the reality by the real one, the one that made the example that most um, clear is, is Anna Pauke, which was like for Romania that she was really um, important at certain point, and then she became she got blamed for all the crimes of Stalinism and also being Jewish, and it's all anti Semitism. So, 
Um, how how the role the roles could also reverse quite quickly. So quite interesting. I, I think what I also think it's important you, that being a politician is always a role of one place. So I, I think within Vida Tomšić this is very clear because the way she speaks, the way she perceives also in the video document we have, you know, she she has this one narrative, one type of speech, one because she's mm -hmm. aware that she she needs to be a certain figure in order to, you know, get her message through or to survive this because after all she was, you know, one of the leading politicians for like half a century. And that's not something that was very easy to achieve. Yeah, and some other women were just marginalized. Yeah. Or, uh, or also it was also for male politicians to have such a long run mm -hmm. in Yugoslavia it was like very hard. So she had to make a role for herself. And I think this role is, you know, it's just, this is one layer of her is the role of politicians. There are also, you know, underlying other things. But like, I think there is like, with someone who has such a vast um, archive, I think it's one can write five or 10 completely different biographies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not one narrative fits all. It's like she was so many different people in so many different mm -hmm. um, times, I think. So, yeah. Okay, so um, I suggest we move on ourselves downstairs stairs slowly uh, because we have food and wine waiting. Oh,